about our pastor, Pastor Manor, his beautiful wife, Shelly. I love you both. I bless God for this opportunity to stand before you, understanding that you are the very best that God has. And I thank Pastor Marina for trusting God enough to place me before you, for you are his precious sheep that he has been called to pastor. I'm grateful for my husband, Deacon Van Hosen. And my three sons who are here this morning, along with, <laughs> along with both of our mothers, family, and many others who are here and who have prayed with me along my journey. Before I move forward with what God has given me today in this divine moment, I ask that you join me in prayer. Father God, in these tender moments that are before me, saturate this place with your Holy Spirit. Pierce the hearts of your people, God. This is your word for this appointed time on this preordained day, God. Let them not see me, Father, but allow them to see your glory, God, revealed. Lord God, it is your preached word that speaks life to your people, God. Let it come forth in a mighty way. It's in your precious name I pray. Amen. Amen. There is a word from the Lord today. If you have your Bibles or your electronic devices, I ask that you stand and go with me to the book of Titus, chapter 3. I will be reading verses 3 through 8 in the New International Version. Again, that's Titus, chapter 3. I'll be reading verses 3 through 8 in the New International Version. Titus chapter 3, verses 3 through 8. If you are ready for the word, do me a favor and shout grace. Grace! Amen. At one time, we too were foolish disobedient, deceived, and enslaved by all kinds of passions and pleasures. We lived in malice and envy, being hated and hating one another. But when the kindness and love of God our Savior appeared, he saved us, not because of righteous things we had done, but because of his mercy. He saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us generously through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that having been justified by his grace, we might become heirs, having the hope of eternal life. This is a trustworthy saying, and I want you to stress these things so that those who have trusted in God may be careful to devote themselves to doing what is good. These things are excellent, and profitable to everyone. Verse three, at one time we too were foolish, disobedient, deceived, and enslaved. My sermon title for your hearing this morning is, I've been a fool, now what? You may take your seats. The Apostle Paul writes this epistle, this letter to Titus, whom he refers to as his son in the ministry. The book of Titus is one of three books in the Bible often referred to as the pastoral books because of its explicit instructions and guidance on how to pastor God's people. If I may give you a little context, Titus was sent to the Greek island of Crete to pastor the church there and appoint elders. This was not an easy assignment. Titus was sent to a place described as being full of conflict, unclean living, and degradation. But I believe it was not a coincidence that it was Titus who was chosen for this mission, for Titus had accompanied Paul in both the church of Corinth and in the church of Philippi. Many theologians believe Titus to be a part of those other believers who traveled with Paul to Jerusalem, as referred to in the book of Acts. Titus had proven his faith being an uncircumcised Gentile 
who was now saved by Christ Jesus. It was his unwillingness to accept that because he was a Gentile, he had to follow the Jewish tradition and custom of circumcision in order to be a true believer of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Titus was a living example, as God revealed through Paul's writings in Romans chapter 2, that the only circumcision necessary is that of the heart by the Holy Spirit. But what is so interesting about this text is that Paul is not addressing the issues on the Greek island of Crete with the people who are referred to as foolish and disobedient, deceived and enslaved. He is not addressing the unslaved. He is addressing the saved, the believers, the saints, the church folks. He advises Titus that it is the people of the church who must be reminded that we too were once. I apologize in advance because this message may not be for the people who have never fallen. This message is for those of us who can say that at one time or another, our foolish actions have looked right in our own eyes. <laughs> Proverbs 12:15 tells us that the way of the fool is right in his own eyes, but he who heeds counsel is wise. The words fool, fools, foolish, foolishly, and foolishness appear in the Bible a combined total of 199 times. That's good news, church. It's not just us. Tell somebody it's not just you. Notice the text says we too were foolish. We is inclusive. Paul didn't ex exclude himself or Titus. This lets us know that Paul, the great man of God that he was, was not excluded from once being foolish. Nor was the young preacher Titus who was sent to establish order and appoint elders in the church on this island of Crete. This morning, I've been sent to talk to people who have done some things been some places and made some mistakes. I don't know if that's you or not, or maybe that's just the other people across the street at the other church, but I'm talking about the people who are saved, but somewhere along the way, the enemy convinced you that your way, the world's way was better than God's way. You have had to find out for yourself that God's word is the truth and the light. I'm talking to someone who knows what it feels like to have God reveal you to yourself. The you that God created you to be. You were once blind, but now you do see. You see, exposure is a good thing because exposure is just God showing you that he still has his hands on you. Because where God exposes, darkness cannot prevail. But I'm speaking to people who have looked for love in all the wrong places when only God's love can fill that place. People who know what it means to have done things that do not reflect who you are. People who know what it feels like to walk in somewhere and immediately know that you don't belong there. I'm talking to those who have at some point been fooled to believe that we would receive the promises of God without any discipline or obedience in our walk. You've had to learn for yourself that God rewards our faithfulness and honors our obedience. See, some of us already know we are lifelong learners. We just ask for new tests. We just ask for new lessons. But Titus, this preacher and pastor, has been told to remind the people of the church to not get church amnesia. And so condemning that you forget that you too were once. That you haven't always lifted up your hands to the Lord. That you haven't always been wise. That you haven't always sat with your prayer cloth draped over your legs. As a matter of fact, even after being saved, many of us can say we too have been, and that it's only by God's grace and mercy. The first point that God has given me to share with you, precious people of God, is that remembrance of your past cannot revoke your purpose. Remembrance of your past cannot revoke your purpose. Your purpose was established long ago, before you were even formed, and it does not change just because you remember your falls. Neither does it change just because somebody else remembers your falls. The word invites us in verse three to remember as we once were. 
your memory is a powerful tool for your journey. You see, we all have terms and markers along our journey that let us know how far we've come and where we've been. Terms where you've gotten to a crossroad in your life and you had to either go left or go right, your way or God's way. Intersections where you've had to stop and evaluate what's coming from all directions. Am I to go or do I wait? Should I move farther or do I plant my feet and stand still? Markers that give you an indication of where you are. Did I learn what I needed to learn in that place or do I have to circle back around that mountain again? How many times will you circle around that same mountain? For some of us, it's taken us 15 years what God has said to do because you've reasoned and rationalized with God trying to force your will over his. How many times will you say, this one is different? when God's truth has not changed. So your memory is a powerful tool for purposeful living. I am fascinated by the miracle of the human brain and its ability to think, remember, retain information. For some time now, I've been researching how the brain learns. And what I've learned is that memory is not stored in one single area of the brain, but it is broken down, broken apart into visual images, emotion, movement, and other sensory areas of the brain. When the brain recalls information, it actually reconstructs it from each area of the brain. But one factor that is important for us today that contributes to our ability to remember is movement. Somebody say movement. Movement is the reason why you can still remember how to ride a bike from when you were a child and have not been on a bike in 20 years, 30 years, I dare say 50 years. Brother Terrence, Brother Antoine, movement is the reason why your fingers seem to remember songs that you learned long ago. Perhaps you needed to read the notes at one point, but now your fingers seem to move all on their own, even if you are given the music. Movement is also the reason why many of you are writing and taking notes right now. Movement of your fingers is connected to your memory. It's the reason why in the movie, Akilah and the Bee, Akilah was able to remember how to spell so many complex words because of the movement. She had a movement with her learning. She tapped her hand as she learned how to spell. See, for those of you who may not know the movie, Akilah was a young, 12-year-old middle school girl from the other side of town. She was from the hood, and she attended one of the roughest schools in the city, but Akilah had a gift. She could spell, I mean spell even the most complicated words, words I struggle to pronounce, let alone spell. Her ability to remember how to spell words was tied to her movement, the movement and her process of learning. Stay with me, church, I'm going somewhere. Her spelling coach recognized this and put a jump rope in her hand. So now she jumped rope as she spelled the words out loud. Every time she said a letter, she jumped. Even when she didn't feel like it. See, there's a certain discipline that is built up in the process of learning. So when she got on stage, though, at the Scripps National Spelling Bee competition, when she had to show and prove what she had remembered, it was the movement that prompted her to remember how to spell the winning word. It was the movement in her process of learning that locked in the memory. All I'm trying to get to, church, is that God told me to tell you that your ability to walk in your purpose is directly tied to your ability to remember how God has moved in your life. I'm going to say that one more time. Your ability to walk in your purpose is directly tied to your ability your, to remember how God has moved in your life, how God has moved in your process of learning. So when you face those big tests of life, when you have to show and prove what you've learned, you have to remember how God has moved. When I remember how God has moved in my life, it's hard for me to keep still. It causes me, it, it, it makes me want to move. I don't, I don't have a jump rope in my hand, but when you see me jump, I'm remembering. When you see me praising, I'm remembering. When you see me shouting choir, I'm remembering. 
God is not stationary. He is not confined. His movement in your life is evidence of your purpose. It's evidence. God said, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. The very hairs on your head are numbered. For we are his workmanship created for good works preordained that we should walk in them. Your memory of your past cannot revoke your purpose. No, quite the opposite. It is necessary for your purpose. It is an inextricable connection. You must keep your memory so that you do not waste time repeating those things which are outside of God's will for your life, those things which are foolish and keep us enslaved. I move on to my second point. Perfection is not the requirement for salvation. Perfection is not the requirement for salvation. The text says in verse 4 and 5, But when the kindness and love of God our Savior appeared, he saved us, not because of righteous things we had done, but because of his mercy. It's through our imperfections where God's transformative power is most evident. It is a display of his love and grace. You are a display of his love and grace. The person who sits next to you is a display of his love and grace. Tell your neighbor, I'm a display of his love and grace. The word says, but when the kindness and love of God appeared, it's nothing like when God shows up in your situation. Somebody knows what I'm talking about. When God shows up, things start moving, things start happening, things start shifting around, appointed people into your life, and people who are displaced in your life must move away. God never said, get it right and come to me. The text says that it is through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit. The washing, the rebirth, and the renewal by the Holy Spirit. You only need to be washed if you've been dirty. Let me explain it this way. Some of us are able to keep our cars shiny and clean. You have it washed every week, always sparkling, rims clean, tires shining, Pastor Marina. So much so that when you have it washed, we really can't tell because we have gotten so used to seeing it clean. But others of us have a more difficult time. The car is so dirty, people can write wash me on the window. The inside has never been detailed. There are old crumbs stuck in crevices you just can't seem to get out on your own. But when this car gets clean, everybody notices. It's as if folks don't even recognize the car. The same body, the same car, but yet somehow it drives different, smells different. Isn't that just like God? God gets the most glory when he transforms the dirtiest, cleans up the filthiest. You have the same body, but there is something different about you. When God washes you, you don't even look like you've been dirty. When the Holy Spirit renews you, you get clean from the inside out. You are detailed, picked apart, only to be put back together again as new. It is only the Holy Spirit who can reach the crumbs of your past that are stuck in the crevices of your heart. First Corinthians chapter two says, for the Holy Spirit searches all things, even the deep things of God. No one knows the thoughts of God except the Spirit of God. So don't get it twisted. This is the work of the Lord. You might want to tell somebody, oh, don't get it twisted. What you're looking at is the work of the Lord. It's God's work. So for those of you who are saying, God, I'm not perfect, let me inform you on today that perfection is not the requirement for salvation. You are who God is waiting for. 
It is because of your imperfection that God's transformation in your life will give God glory. The text says God wants to make you an heir and that this is a trustworthy saying. There is so much that God wants to release to you. As a believer, we not only need to remember that we once were, but also our response to trouble now should be quite different than our responses to trouble then. Trouble doesn't cease just because you're saved, just because you now have salvation. Trouble doesn't cease. Ah. Oh. But if you allow the Holy Spirit to get in those deep places, your response to trouble is transformed and new. The change that you desire to see is within. It's within. So my final point that God has given me to share with you this morning is that when God can trust you with trouble, he can trust you with the blessing. When we prove that we can be trusted with trouble, then God can trust you with the blessing. When you refuse as a believer to stop praising God, when you refuse to stop showing up for God, when you refuse to stop loving, to stop giving, to stop tithing, in spite of all indicators in your life that would suggest that you should give up and quit, you are saying, God, you can trust me. God wants you to remember the terms, the intersections, and the markers along your way so that when the blessing comes, when the blessing comes, you will have the strength and wisdom to walk in it. You are saying, God, I trust you with my life. God is trustworthy. How many of you all know God is trustworthy? God has a track record of being trustworthy. The apostle Paul knew God to be trustworthy. He said, I am not ashamed. I know whom I have believed. And I am persuaded that he is able to keep me. Hannah knew God to be trustworthy. And I'm not talking about Hannah from the haves and have nots. I'm talking about, I'm talking about Hannah in the word of God who was barren could not have children, and was verbally persecuted daily by Paniah. Hannah prayed to God, if you bless me with a child, I will give him back to you. Hannah trusted God while enduring trouble, and God blessed her with a son, Samuel, who would be the prophet to anoint David as king. You have no idea of the level of blessing that is being held just for you. Peter knew God to be trustworthy. Jesus told Peter, I have prayed for you. You have faith you, that your faith may not fail. Even after denying knowing Jesus, it was Peter who Jesus told, upon this rock, I will build my church. Mary, the mother of Jesus, knew, to, knew God to be trustworthy. When the Holy Spirit impregnated her with Jesus, Mary did not know all that her journey ahead would encompass, but she said, yes, God, I'll trust you. Let me come a little closer to you because I know some of us in here know God to be trustworthy for our Ourselves. It was God who kept his hands on you when you turned left and he said, go right. God promised to never leave you or forsake you. It was God who interceded on your behalf when the enemy intended to destroy you. God promised he is with you wherever you go. It was God, God who was your rock, your strength, your fortress when they walked away. God promised that when you are weak, he is strong. It was God, God who was your provider when you found yourself unemployed and broke God promised that never will the righteous be forsaken or their seeds begging bread it was God who allowed the weapon to be formed but did not let it prosper the devil meant it for evil but God meant it for good it was God who kept you for such a time as this hallelujah Glory to God. As I try to conclude, for those of you who are bold enough to say that at one time or another, I too have been foolish, disobedient, enslaved. Those of you who are courageous enough to admit to yourself the real story, not the story you tell everybody else that minimizes your part. but the real story. God says he has an answer for you. 
You see, it really doesn't matter the situation, circumstance, or difficulty you face. The same question still remains, the question of now what? Now what? Well, your now what is clearly stated in your word. Take a look at verse 8. Devote yourself to doing what you are purposed to do. And doing what is good to doing what's in God's will for your life. This means you have to do something, church. Don't just hear the word. Add to your faith the work. Why go through all of that to make the same decisions, expecting a different outcome? The word says that devoting yourself to your purpose is excellent and profitable, not just to you, but to everyone. Not only will you be blessed, but all who are connected to you will be blessed. God says, but for this very purpose I have let you live, that I might show you my power, and that my name may be declared throughout all the earth. God is able to redeem you and restore you. I am a witness. God says, don't be afraid of their faces. In other words, don't be afraid of your haters. One of the things that Akilah had to deal with were haters. When she first started walking in her purpose, those who knew her laughed. And they said she wasn't good enough because she was just like them. She was from where they were from. They had seen it all. They had seen her bad side. Well, and for a minute, it caused her to want to quit. But she didn't. She endured the process. By the time she got to where God was taking her, even her haters had to recognize God's glory. Don't let people keep you from walking in your purpose. Don't you worry about them haters, because by the time God gets you where he wants to take you, even your haters have to recognize the power of God over your life. Your haters can only see you from the inside, but God works, so your haters can only see you from the outside, but God works from the inside out. They don't even know who you are. Therefore, stand fast in the liberty where Christ has set you free and do not be entangled again in the yoke of bondage. If you do not respond to this now what question correctly, God, will allow you to continue to be tested in similar situation after situation until you realize that the correct answer to the question, until you realize the correct answer to the question, until you have no doubt that you're now what is trusting God, that you're now what is faithfulness, that you're now what is walking in your purpose. Start making decisions that honor God and watch the blessings God will release in your life. Amen. We can trust God at his word. By his grace, we are saved, born again, and renewed by the Holy Spirit. Let God do the washing. Let the Holy Spirit do the detailing. And don't forget how God has moved in your process of learning. For he is trustworthy. He is trustworthy. At this time, I open up the doors of the church. Don't miss this opportunity. Glory, God. Glory, God. Glory, God.